let's uh, take our seats, please. And we'll start in just another moment. Okay, let's all sit down and um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to introduce Molly Crockett. Uh, Molly is really one of my favorite psychologists working today. So uh, it's really an honor to have her here. Uh, I first got to know her work and was just blown away by the range of uh, work that she has done. Uh, Molly uh, was an undergraduate at UCLA. She then went to the University of Cambridge for her PhD work. She worked with Trevor Robbins. Uh, those of you who uh, know affective neuroscience know the seminal role that Trevor Robbins played in the development of um, of affective neuroscience more generally and more specifically in uh, in his work in uh, neuropharmacology uh, and the neurochemical mechanisms underlying um, motivation and other psychological processes. Uh, Molly went to Oxford uh, after that with a stint at Zurich, where she um, did some work in neuroeconomics. Uh, and uh, then from there went to Yale and was there for a while and just moved to Princeton. Um, so uh, uh, she, one of the central framing uh, features of her work has been a concern with uh, morality uh, and with pro-social behavior. And one of the things that I love about Molly's work is that she has found ways to harness uh, naturalistically occurring behavior in wild and different settings, which we'll, I'm sure, hear some about today, uh, and do it in an incredibly rigorous way. Uh, she has a paper currently in press, or maybe it's just come out. I'm sure we'll hear about some of it today in Nature Human Behavior, uh, analyzing data from Twitter feeds uh, that help reveal some of the pernicious, I think, um, forces that are at work in our society today that increase polarization. Uh, and uh, uh, this is work that I think has the potential to really help to heal some of the um, divisions which are eating away at our democracy. Um, so uh, it's really uh, great to have Molly and please welcome me, welcome Molly to Madison. Thank you so much, Richie. It's a pleasure to be here. And I just came from the most awesome roundtable discussion with students and postdocs. And I'm every time I uh, talk with trainees about sort of the future of the field, I feel really optimistic, which is great medicine in the times that we're living in now. Um, my work really takes as a starting point, um, one that I think is different from the dominant mode of training in which I was brought up, which is, you know, I was trained in neuroscience. And I think in neuroscience, the, 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 the culture of, of the research is really to think a lot about the individual. We study individuals, individual brains, individual cognition. And even if we're interested in social questions, the methods and the results and the reporting in our papers really do come down to the individual. Lately, though, I've been thinking a lot more about the collective. And in particular, you know, we're, we're talking a lot at this meeting about psychopathology and, and, and the suffering that people face from mental illnesses. And I think we can benefit from zooming out and thinking about how suffering manifests, not just at the individual level, but also at the collective level. And the role that we all can play in moving our culture forward um, towards one that's 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 healthier and, and more flourishing. So the writer um, Arundhati Roy wrote an article at the beginning of the pandemic that inspired the title of this talk. Um, and she wrote, 
Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one's no different. And as a cognitive scientist studying altruism and cooperation, I've thought a lot about this over the past few years. How can we use this time that we are in to imagine our world anew? And what role could cognitive science psychology possibly play in this project? And so today I wanna to play with an idea that the theories we have and share about human nature can have a profound impact on how we go about this project of imagining our world anew. Specifically, I'm interested in whether this question, that's a really you know, long-standing question, um, can have a normative force. And that's the question, is human nature fundamentally selfish or fundamentally altruistic? And I'm not going to answer this question directly because I don't think that the answer is straightforward. Instead, what I wanna argue is that the way that people tend to answer this question is cultural and it can create self-fulfilling prophecies for individuals, for communities, and maybe even the whole planet. So in other words, the stories that we tell about human nature create the worlds we live in. This talk has three parts. In the first part, I'm gonna introduce this really influential model Homo economicus, uh, that treats human nature as fundamentally selfish. And I'm gonna share just a little bit of evidence from social neuroscience that unsettles this model. In the second part of the talk, I'm gonna share two lines of work from my lab, demonstrating how social norms for outrage and generosity can create self-fulfilling prophecies in individuals and communities. And if there's time at the end, not sure if there will be, um, I'll just give a little tiny sketch of a new theory we're developing in our lab. Um, that might explain how the myth of Homo economicus came to be so popular in the first place, why it will not die, and how we might go about resisting it. Okay, Homo economicus has a long intellectual history. Its roots actually trace back at least to Aristotle, the rational part of rational self-interest, um, but it really got going in the Enlightenment. So um, some of you might have studied uh, Hobbes and the Leviathan, um, who wrote, uh, the condition of man is a condition of war of everyone against everyone. Uh, father of modern economics, Adam Smith, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. One of the founding fathers of this country, James Madison, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. The implication being that like, they're not angels and so we do need government. And um, in the mid 20th century, um, some very influential movements in economics, namely game theory and neoclassical economics associated with, with the, the Chicago School, formalized the model of homo economicus and built entire fields of study on it that had a huge influence on policy. And then in the later part of the, the 20th century, um, public intellectuals like Richard Dawkins amplified this idea, right? He writes, let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. And these ideas were coming into the public imagination against a cultural backdrop, backdrop of Reg Reagan, Thatcher, and the rise of neoliberalism. So you could see that this idea sort of traces back a really long time. And this is a really rough sketch and incomplete history, but I just want to situate us in this, in this tradition. Like this is a really you know, long-standing idea theory that predates psychology and neuroscience, right? But in the last part of the 20th century, um, there began to be some pushback against this idea. And the most convincing um, critiques came from um, economics, specifically behavioral economics and also neuroscience. So by the 80s and 90s, the new field of behavioral economics, which applied psychological insights to economic models, um, was revealing the limitations of homo economicus. And Richard Thaler documented these in a column he called anomalies, which um, are difficult to rationalize uh, within existing economic models. And this include observations of cooperation, as well as um, economic games like the dictator game, where you give somebody some money and they have the chance to offer some of that money to a complete stranger. 
homo economicus would keep everything, but everyone started observing, oh, people actually do like to share money in dictator games. This is weird. Um, or the ultimatum game, where uh, similar to the ultimatum game, a first mover splits a pot of money with a second mover. That person can then reject the offer, in which case neither player is paid, or they can accept it um, and keep the money. Homo economicus would never reject any money, but it turns out people care about fairness. Shocker. Um, and so these experiments demonstrated very robustly and repeatedly that you can't explain human behavior with this simplified model. With the advent of fMRI in the late 90s, these paradigms got easily transported to the scanner, and there was a flourishing of research to investigate the neural basis of these so-called social preferences, which were difficult to explain within the homo economicus model. So, um, for example, studies of dictator games or studies of donations to charity revealed um, that when people are given the opportunity to, to donate, um, you see activation in the ventral striatum, which at the time this study was published in Science in 2007, had only previously really been robustly associated with individual rewards. But what this study showed, which is obvious to us now, but was remarkable at the time, is that in these reward-sensitive regions of the brain, there is an overlap between receiving money for yourself and choosing to donate that money to somebody else. Here are data from a recent meta-analysis of fMRI studies of generosity giving. Um, that's 36 studies and 1,100 patients. And you can see robustly that sharing with other people activates these classic reward system regions of the brain, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, ventral striatum, and so on. Same thing goes with this idea of altruistic punishment, the idea that when we enforce social norms, when we observe somebody behaving unfairly or in an untrustworthy way, and we have the opportunity to invest in punishing that behavior, that also activates classic reward regions in the striatum. So this is from the first fMRI study of altruistic punishment published in 2002. Um, that's a study of punishing trust, uh, untrustworthy behavior. Um, in my PhD, I did some work on the neural basis of um, decision-making in the ultimatum game that I described earlier. And we find that when people reject offers they perceive to be unfair, you see activation in the striatum. And moreover, we can demonstrate a causal role of the striatum um, indirectly through um, manipulating its sensitivity to unfairness uh, with tryptophan depletion. So when you deplete uh, serotonin levels in the brain, the striatum becomes more sensitive to unfairness and it activates more when people reject unfair behavior. Finally, more recently in my lab, we've looked at how the brain's response to money depends on the social consequences of earning that money in a way that suggests that the brain's reward system is sensitive to the moral valuation of money. And when it's earned in a dishonest or harmful way, that that money is actually subjectively worth less. So we bring people into the lab, they're randomly assigned to the roles of decider or receiver, um, and they make decisions where they make trade-offs between different amounts of money and different numbers of mildly painful electric shocks that we deliver either to the person making the decisions or to the receiver who's a stranger sitting in a different room. They're never going to meet, their roles are not going to reverse. So we set up the situation in a way that really limits the possibility for what you might call selfish motivations for um, refraining to shock a stranger for money. So again, what would homo economicus do? Homo economicus would totally shock the stranger for money because money is something that satisfies self-interest and homo economicus doesn't care about anyone else besides himself. But, you know, spoiler alert, we don't find this. So um, we use a computational model to model the difference in subjective value between options like this that are varying over trials in the amount of money that they deliver to the participant and the amount of shocks that they deliver either to the participant or to the receiver, who's the stranger in the other room. So the difference in value between these options that they're deciding between, um, or delta V, um, can be modeled uh, as a function of the difference in money between those two options, the difference in shocks between those two options, and then those get scaled by an exchange rate, kappa, which quantifies the cost of pain for self and other. So here I'm plotting kappa against the price per shock, and um, in our experiments, 
Um, some people will refuse to deliver a single shock for about $30. Um, so even if we pay them $30, they won't deliver the shock. Other people are willing to deliver 20 shocks to another person for an, uh, an amount of, of 10 cents profit, uh, homo economicus. Um, so what we want to do is look on average, right? First of all, you know, what are the exchange rates that people are willing to accept? And um, crucially, how much money do we have to pay people to shock themselves versus this stranger sitting in another room who they're never going to meet again? And what we find consistently is that people require more money to inflict this mild pain on a stranger than to inflict the same amount of pain on themselves. Um, this translates into about 30 cents per shock for self and 60 cents per shock for other. And this effect has been replicated a bunch of times in my lab and also in another independent lab. And again, homo economicus cannot explain this behavior. There are no external incentives like fear of punishment or reciprocity to prevent people from just taking the maximum profit in this situation. So then we wanted to see the neural correlates of this decision-making process. I'm just gonna show a few of the results. We used model-based fMRI to decompose the factors that contribute to these decisions. And what this is doing is taking the parameters in this model and regressing them against bold responses um, in our fMRI data. And what we want to actually look at is how the neural representation of money changes trial to trial as a function of how that money was earned. So we're gonna look at these parametric responses to differing amounts of money um, contrasted between when that money is earned by shocking yourself versus when it's earned by shocking a stranger. And what we find is that activity in the stratum uh, is sensitive to the moral consequences of money. Um, so here you can see this region is positively correlated with the amount of money you get um, in the self trials, um, but that association is reduced um, in the, the trials where you can get money from shocking a stranger. Um, and we can predict individual differences in the exchange rate by looking at how sensitive the brain's reward network is to those ill-gotten gains. Okay. So that is just a small taste of the many, many, many studies that have been published in social neuroscience and behavioral economics um, that contradict directly this model of homo economicus. Um, so this, this idea really should be dead by now, but somehow it refuses to die. Many of the findings that I just shared often invite explanations in terms of selfishness. And I hope we can maybe discuss this in the q and I'm really curious other people's intuitions. So some people might say who want to defend this self-interest model, well, the fact that giving to other people activates the brain's reward system is proof that someone is selfishly getting something out of donating money to another person. And this idea has you know, taken force under a lot of different names, but you can see in the literature studies of things like impure altruism or tainted altruism. And if you get something out of, uh, out of being helpful to another person, some people judge this as morally worse than not being helpful at all, which is wild to me. Um, okay, so at this point you might say, well, all models, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So what is wrong with having this intuition that human nature is fundamentally selfish? And um, I'm, I'm gonna now try to argue that I think this is harmful and I'm worried about it. A good argument comes from one of my favorite papers uh, published by Dale Miller in 1999 called The Norm of Self-Interest. And the idea is that our beliefs about other people's altruism or selfishness impact our behavior and create self-fulfilling prophecies. So in this paper, Miller argues that self-interest is a Western cultural norm that has a descriptive component and a prescriptive component. And the, the descriptive component is that you know, self-interest is in fact a powerful determinant of behavior. And the prescriptive component is self-interest ought to be a powerful determinant of behavior. And he then in this paper reviews evidence that the norm of self-interest impacts people's actions, opinions, as well as their narratives 
about those actions and opinions. And that's something we're going to come back to at the end of the top. So just remember that for a while. Scientists do this too. And actually, um, my PhD student, Ryan Carlson, oh, he just got his PhD, actually. So Dr. Ryan Carlson has some really interesting work that I might have time to discuss in the Q&A. But I'm going to pull a quote from a paper by an economist, um, Christoph Engel, who uh, published in 2011 a meta-analysis of all of the dictator game studies that had been run up to that point. It's a really fascinating read. Um, what he finds is that on average in a dictator game, people will give 20% of the pie to a stranger. And he interprets it in this way. Even those who in principle are generous to a degree exploit the opportunity to their advantage. Even generous subjects thus tend to have a selfish side. And it's just like, this is such a fascinating piece of like scientific culture. And uh, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about this stuff lately. So I think M Miller makes a compelling point here. Um, and I think I worry that what he identified is even worse today because we are hyper-connected online and narratives about human behavior and the motives behind those behaviors, which are not visible, but people nonetheless supply in the stories we tell, these can instantly go viral, ricochet around the globe and have effects on our emotions that are important for individual well-being and also collective well-being. So in the next part of the talk, I'm gonna share two lines of work from my lab showing how our beliefs about social norms um, can impact our behavior. So the first line of work explores the idea that we are living in an age of outrage fueled by social media algorithms that amplify anger for profit. And the second line of work is deeply contrastive to the first line of work, um, exploring social behavior at an event called Burning Man, um, which is a temporary community organized explicitly around a norm of generosity. Okay, so I started thinking about outrage uh, in 2016. I was living in the UK, Brexit happened, much to many people's surprise. And then we saw Trump get elected and I was spending a lot of time on social media, too much time. And because I had been trained in like reinforcement learning and decision-making, I was like, oh, I wonder if these ideas can explain this. Um, so we have since then um, developed a program of research addressing the following questions. Is there a norm of outrage expression on social media? in general, or maybe in some corners of it? If so, how do outrage expression norms develop? Can we pinpoint the role of different kinds of social learning in the way that we understand and express other people's emotions online? And finally, how do outrage norms impact our collective beliefs about intergroup hostility, how much the other side hates us, and so on? So before I go on, I was just wanna give a brief definition of how we're thinking about moral outrage, which comes from the psychology literature, it's typically defined as anger and disgust that is evoked by a perceived violation of a moral standard. Um, it tends to motivate people to shame and punish the transgressor. And importantly for our purposes, um, it tends to make group identity more salient. So in a political discussion, if you're outraged, you're gonna be more likely to identify with your group and probably more likely to, um, to de-identify or feel negatively towards the out group. So we know that social media wants to keep us online because the longer we stay online, the more money they make from their advertising. And so what social media algorithms do is they decide to show us information that their algorithms predict will hook us. And to do that, uh, they, they run lots and lots and lots of analyses of the type of information that actually hooks individual users. And what that has found is that outrage evoking content is among the most engaging con content. Um, this, is, this has been, replicated many, many times. It's a well-known fact. It's also not new. So here's a cartoon from the yellow journalism era, the late, the late 19th century. Um, and I don't know if you can see this, but these are little, um, little evil spirits coming out of a, a printing press, um, in, including scandal, hypocrisy, and abuse of rivals. Um, so people were worried about this um, you know, more than 100 years ago. Um, 
But I do think that there's a sense that this phenomenon is, is getting worse in the digital age, because unlike in the era of you know, pre-internet, social media users are not just passive consumers of information, they're also active participants. So in particular, we can observe other people's reactions to the news we're consuming in real time, and we can also reward each other for sharing certain types of information over others through the buttons that the platforms choose to provide to us for our expression. Okay, we wanted to study this in the wild, so we needed to build a way to measure moral outrage expressions on social media. We used supervised learning to do this. Um, we built a deep neural net machine learning classifier, for those of you who that, that means something to. Um, and we trained the classifier using a data set of 26,000 tweets that we collected from a variety of episodes of viral public outrage that engaged a range of ideologies. We wanted this to generalize across liberals and conservatives. So we included to train the classifier tweets um, from mostly liberals about Trump's uh, transgender military ban, outrage from mostly conservatives about actor Jesse Smollett's faked altercation with Trump supporters, outrage from both sides about the Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings, a uh, viral video about some students who attended a protest a few years back, um, and also an episode of non-political outrage. Some of you might remember there was a video um, where a man was violently dragged off a United Airlines flight. Everyone hates airlines. It's a universal outrage. Um, we then use theory-driven instructions to train humans to hand label all 26,000 of those tweets as to whether they contained outrage or not. This was distributed across many humans. We didn't have any single human rate 26,000 tweets, that would be a lot. Um, with this label data, we then use machine learning to build this classifier um, that can take in a series of tweets, as many as you want, and then spit out a classification uh, as to a prediction of whether that tweet contains outrage or not. Um, this is freely available on GitHub if you want to use it in your research, although Elon Musk shut down the Twitter API, which is seriously limiting the ability to do research on Twitter now, which is super disappointing. Um, here are a couple of examples of tweets categorized by our classifier from the, the Supreme Court hearings, just to give you a taste of how this is going. This is an outrage tweet, um, and this is a non-outrage tweet. The accuracy of the classifier is around 76%, which is about how well um, humans can do. So essentially the judgments that a human would make as to whether a tweet contains outrage or not um, are, are pretty comparable to the judgments that our classifier will make. But do keep in mind that there are errors in this. Um, so, you know, uh, we acknowledge that. Um, definitely something we're thinking about a lot these days as machine learning is encroaching more and more into our lives. And having worked with these models, it's like, yeah, accurate can mean a lot of different things. So, you know, um, okay. So to test our hypotheses, we constructed data sets by identifying users whose tweets appeared in our data sets. And we wanted to uh, compare users with higher versus lower levels of political engagement. So we took one group of users um, who had tweeted about the Kavanaugh situation, and we took another group of users um, who had tweeted about the United situation as a way of sort of roughly approximating people who are likely to be highly versus less politically engaged. Then, um, we, we scraped the tweet history of all of the users. So basically every user who appears in those data sets, we can, um, we can get all of the tweets they've ever sent back in time. And um, we gather also how much each of those tweets got a like or a retweet. And then we are applying the outrage classifier to each tweet because what we really wanna do is um, ultimately test the relationship over time between the rewards you get for expressing outrage or not today from your peer group and the likelihood of expressing outrage tomorrow or next week and so on. Okay, so we wanted to test two hypotheses about possible digital amplification, amplification of outrage. First, we tested the idea that users are going to learn to express more outrage over time um, by matching their expressions to what they infer is normative among their peers. Um, so you can imagine that networks might vary in their level of outrage and newcomers to the network would observe how much outrage is around. 
and then sort of fine tune or adjust their expressions uh, to conform to what they perceive to be as common in their group. So as outrage spreads through social networks, individuals might learn through observation that outrage expression is, is normative and then become more likely to express that themselves. We also hypothesize that users would learn to express more outrage over time through direct social reinforcement. So online, outrage gets triggered by stimuli that call attention to some violation. And then people express outrage with a range of responses, um, including like, uh, liking it or sending, uh, sending the message to others, sharing, and so on. Um, and outrage expressions get a disproportionate amount of likes and shares as we know. Um, so those po positive outcomes then reinforce, we predict the outrage responses. And through this process, we can expect individual users' outrage expressions to increase over time to the extent that they get socially rewarded for those expressions. And to the extent, you know, a, a more fine-grained prediction is, is, you know, is there a prediction error? Because we know that that's what drives learning. And so this is just a super basic application to your you know, textbook reinforcement learning to this very applied setting. Um, so I'm not claiming that there's necessarily anything different going on here, but it is nevertheless important to demonstrate just the scale of this and its consequences. Okay, so I'm just gonna summarize the results um, and I'm happy to go into more detail in the Q&A. Um, we find that um, regardless of level of political engagement, um, users are more likely to express outrage in networks where outrage is more common. So we do see evidence for this norm learning or observational learning account. We also see evidence for reinforcement learning. The rewards that you get for today's outrage positively predict tomorrow's probability of expressing outrage, uh, especially when the rewards are higher than expected, when there's a positive prediction error. And a third, a third observation um, that is consistent with uh, work in reinforcement learning is when you have an explicit norm for people to follow, they are less sensitive to the individual level reinforcement. So the reinforcement effect is weaker in networks where outrage is more common. And so people can follow the crowd and don't need to pay attention as much to the local rewards that they are getting. Now, those are all um, correlational studies, right? We can't, uh, we can't randomly assign people to see more or less outrage um, on their own social media feeds, but we can uh, create a simulation in the lab. So we wanted to verify um, with experiments um, in, a, in a sort of faux Twitter setting. So we set up um, a sort of fake social media feed where subjects were exposed to either a lot of outrage or a little bit of outrage. Um, in an initial scrolling stage, they're just scrolling through these feeds um, to which they were randomly assigned. And then um, in a subsequent learning stage, they were presented with pairs of tweets um, that were pulled from the same topic um, and asked to select the tweet that they thought would get the most likes in the network whose feed that they had just scrolled. And we assigned feedback based on the network norms. So um, in this outrage norm condition, people get more rewards for, for choosing the outrage tweet. And in the low, uh, in the neutral norm condition, they get more rewards for expressing the neutral tweet. Probabilistically, it's not a totally direct um, mapping. And so what we find in this lab experiment, um, and we did a few different iterations of this experiment, is um, evidence for both observational and reinforcement learning. So you can see on the very first trial here, that people are matching their, uh, their levels of outrage expression to the perceived norm of the feed. Um, and then over time, you can see that these expressions are increasing to the extent um, that they are reinforced. Um, but you can note that the effect is stronger for the neutral um, norm condition, um, that this is a steeper slope. Um, so we see this interaction where people are less sensitive to the individual level feedback when they can already learn from trial one, just through observational learning, what expression is most sort of appropriate in their network. Okay, so social media amplifies outrage. Journalists have been writing about this since 2014, even though there wasn't really data for this until we published our paper. Um, but this is a very intuitive idea. So what? Well. We've been really interested in misperception, and that I think is the paper that uh, Richie alluded to just came out um, last week. 
functional democracies require that we all have an accurate shared understanding about one another's moral attitudes on political issues. But because social media decouples the expression of outrage from its experience, you might appear outraged to other people on social media without actually feeling that outraged yourself. And so other people might falsely believe that you are more outraged than you actually are. And when you put this in a network, it gets really intense really quickly, okay? So our news feeds are not representative of our entire network. Um, our news feeds cherry pick information that they think is gonna engage us and keep us online longer. But our minds might make inferences about the level of emotion in our network um, as if they are representative. So imagine this network where a minority of individuals are outraged, expressing outrage about some issue. Um, those posts are, posts are predicted to get a lot of engagement. And so they're more likely to show up in the newsfeed. And then an individual user might infer that more people in the network are outraged and that those individuals are more outraged than they actually are. So we wanted to test this. And um, my former postdoc, Billy Brady, who's now an assistant professor at Kellogg Northwestern um, and my current PhD student, Kelly McLaughlin, designed this super clever pipeline um, to really get at this directly. So we had an author phase and an observer phase in these experiments. Um, in the author phase, we collected tweets in real time and we classified their level of outrage using our classifier. And then we send direct messages to the authors of those tweets. And we ask them, hey, on a scale of one to seven, how outraged were you when you sent this tweet? We then store those tweets and the ratings that the authors of the tweets gave into a database. And then in an observer phase, we show the tweets only to a separate group of observers and ask the observers to rate how outraged and also how happy do you think that the author of this tweet was when they sent it? And then what we can do is compare the author's actual ratings of their emotion with the predicted ratings from the observers. And what we predicted and also found is that the observers consistently judge the authors of the tweets to be more outraged than the authors themselves actually report feeling. And this effect is specific to outrage, so we don't see overperception of happiness ratings. And here are the data from three studies. And what's really especially striking about this data is that you would predict this effect would be stronger in people who are spending a lot of time on social media talking about politics, which was the topic of the outrage tweets that we were studying here. Because if your experience on social media is you see a lot of outrage, that is gonna set a prior that there's a lot of outrage here. And so when you see a signal that is ambiguous, if you have a higher prior belief that people are outraged because you see a lot of it in your feed, you're gonna be more likely to say that this person's really outraged. And so that's what we find. We see a positive correlation between the over-perception effect. So the difference um, between what the authors uh, say and the observers say, and um, how much people report using social media to learn about politics. Okay, so what are the consequences? The consequences of over-perceiving outrage um, were, was something that we looked at in a series of studies. So we have tweets in our database that um, vary in their levels of reported and perceived outrage. We can take these tweets and make a simulated feed where the level of actual outrage reported by the authors of the tweets is identical, but in the over-perception feed, these are tweets that the observers um, tend to over-perceive, and in the accurate perception tweet, uh, feed, um, they're tweets that the observers tend to accurately perceive. So we expose subjects in experiments to these over-perception or accurate perception feeds. And then we measure um, their uh, collective judgment. How outraged in general do you think the members of this social network in general are? And norm judgment task. Um, they were shown new tweets that varied in their level of outrage and asked to judge how socially appropriate is this new tweet to post in this network. 
So it's a very subtle manipulation because as I said earlier, the tweets are all matched in these feeds in terms of what the authors who wrote the tweets reported their level of outrage to be. But what's different is whether those tend to be overperceived or accurately perceived. And so what we find is that relative to scrolling through the accurate perception feed, scrolling through the overperception feed uh, increases perceptions of collective outrage in the network, increases beliefs about norms of outrage expression in the network, and polarizes beliefs about the network's feelings towards in-groups and out-group members, and increases beliefs about the network's ideological extremity. So back to our model, we find, I think, good support that what is going on here is this algorithmic amplification of the types of content which generate engagement, and that happens to include outrage, tends to create distorted beliefs in the minds of individual users about how outraged people are in their network and knock on consequences for their broader beliefs about how hostile and polarized people on the other side are. And this is pretty concerning. And it becomes even more concerning when we consider that bad actors can seed the network with misinformation that is engineered to provoke outrage. How am I doing on time? We started a little bit late. Okay, so I think I'm going to zoom through the fake news bit um, because the conclusions are super simple. We predicted and found that tweets containing links to websites known to host misinformation, false information, evoke more outrage on Twitter and also Facebook than tweets containing links to websites that are more reputable news sources. And I'll just show one data, data point that is my favorite. Um, it's estimated that as much as 60% of articles on social media are shared without actually being read first. And this has led uh, some platforms to give a little reminder like, hey, seems like you wanna share this article, but you haven't actually clicked through to the link. Um, do you wanna actually read the article before sharing it? We were able to get access to Facebook data um, that contained both whether people had clicked through and read an article before they shared it, and also the um, amount of angry reactions that that article generated in general. And what we find across three studies is that articles that, are, that evoke anger reactions on Facebook are more likely to be shared without having been read first. So that's like, that's quite concerning. Um, and, and we're thinking, um, we're thinking about the broader implications for just like even false information is generating um, is generating these collective beliefs about outrage and like how does this spiral out of control um, over time? Okay, so in the last fifteen minutes, I'm just going to share a few um, a few pieces of data from a contrastive uh, research program. Um, and you know, the idea of getting together in large groups, spreading around misinformation that generates outrage and hate towards other groups, not a new thing. Again, from 17th century witch hunts to the Nazi rallies in Nuremberg to recent mass gatherings of white supremacists um, in this country and elsewhere, crowds that are united around a hateful story about outgroups not a good thing, have committed you know, some of the worst atrocities that humans have inflicted on one another. But mass gatherings don't always lead to division and violence. And in the next part of the talk, I'm gonna share some of our work studying a mass gathering um, that is deliberately set up to promote and cultivate norms of generosity. So um, we're interested in, can this norm of self-interest be reversed? And if so, what is the psychological impact? What is the subjective experience like? And how long does the impact last? So um, Burning Man is an experiment in temporary community. Every summer in August, um, there is a city that is set up in the Nevada desert, around 80,000 people. Um, this is a bird's eye view. Um, you can get a sense of the scale here. It's huge. It's a real city. 
There's a post office, there's a newspaper, radio station, bars, restaurants, public library, um, lots and lots of art. And many people who attend this event report that it changed their life. It's kind of a cliche, um, but I think that there is something very powerful about experience a culture in which uh, homo economicus is actually dead. Um, so Burning Man is founded on what they call the 10 principles. Um, they're listed here. Um, they're shared cultural values that include gifting, communal effort, civic responsibility, and the event operates on a gift economy. People bring all sorts of gifts from a cart full of bananas to hand out to a hug deli where you can choose what kind of hug you want. Um, there's not, it's not bartering, the gifts are unconditional. Um, and people feel very strongly about these norms and the norms are enforced through gossip and some light shaming. So here is the weekly newspaper. Um, this was a cover story, the six types of people who will ruin Burning Man just by being here. So even before you go for the first time, you're warned against being one of these types of people. So it's a really, really fascinating sort of anthropological experience to go and, and see what it looks like when there is a community set up to really explicitly promote generosity. And um, Burning Man is um, just one of, of many different types of events like this. Um, Burning Man is somewhat unique in its culture, but um, we wanted to sort of uh, go to events like this and, and measure generosity over time. Um, and we went to a lot of different events to sort of see um, how much generalizes beyond this, this unique event. Um, in terms of generality though, I should say that these results um, are still in a quite limited population, uh, Western secular context. It's a very self-selecting population. And so like the generalizability of these results are very, very limited. Nevertheless, I think they're super interesting. Um, so we sampled uh, participants um, before the event, um, while they were there, one to four months after, uh, or sorry, one to four weeks after and six months after um, each little, Icon represents 100 participants. Um, and some of these uh, we were able to get within subjects longitudinal data. I won't, I won't have time to go into those details, um, but we collected several measures, including sort of subjective experiences of transformation, mood, demographics, what substances people were using. Also a measure we're, we're calling universal connectedness. It's sort of the overlap people experience between themselves and others. Um, and a lot of these measures, um, are related to the concept of awe that Rebecca was talking about yesterday. It's complicated to measure generosity in a gift economy because the dictator game, which uses money um, that I alluded to earlier, um, doesn't really make sense in this cultural context. So we developed an uh, alternative dictator game where participants were given tickets that were exchangeable for items that are really valuable at, uh, at a festival setting, including um, sort of uh, sunscreen, um, fans, neck scarves, and so on. Um, people got really excited about this. So we know that the tickets were worth something to these uh, participants. We also me measured um, social discounting or moral expansion. Um, this was a hypothetical measure. We said, uh, imagine you had 14 hours of free time. How much of that time would you spend doing a favor for the first socially closest person to you, second, third, fifth, 10th, and so on. And um, this type of a measure uh, typically shows a hyperbolic discounting function where people wanna do more uh, to help those who are closest to them um, with a hyperbolically decreasing function as you move further away. And we were predicting um, in addition to increased generosity in this cultural ge generosity, um, the de generosity might be more expansive towards people who are more socially distant. So a curve that looks more like this. Okay. so. Um, People did report having transformative experiences at these mass gatherings. Um, that increase over time, um, the effects are persisting in the follow-up surveys. And um, in particular, the nature of this transformative experience, um, again, looks like awe. People endorse items like, I felt more socially connected to something larger than myself. I perceive something new about other people. Okay, so then when you look at uh, when you look at the dictator game results, here is the level of average donation in the dictator game meta-analysis that I mentioned earlier, um, just over 25%. Um, here's what we see at these events. Um, it's, it, it's really, really striking. Um, it's higher than 50% on average. People are 
really, um, really uh, enthusiastically giving away these tickets. Um, and it doesn't actually increase over time. It's something um, that kind of looks like the pattern of the observational learning in the social media studies where immediately people are observing what the local norm is and matching their behavior to that. And um, on site, there's no correlation between transformative experience and um, how generous people are being. Um, here's one of the uh, envelopes from one of our participants. Enjoy the envelope. I don't need tickets. I got love. So uh, it's quite fun. Okay, so what about after? Um, what we see after is that um, one to four weeks post-event, the more transformed people felt while they, while they were there, um, the more generous they are. And this is with a more traditional dictator game of, of uh, giving money to charity online. Um, and we see the same thing six months post where there is a persistent generosity effect that's correlated with um, how transformed they felt while they were on site. We also observe an effective time on the moral expansion component. So um, this is the discounting curve for uh, donating hypothetical time on day one, um, after a couple of days and so on, you find um, that the curve is getting less steep. It's a small effect, but it's in the, it's in the, if the direction we predicted. Um, and all these results that I'm showing you uh, are controlling for all types of substance use. We asked extensively about what substances people were using. Um, so these, these effects are over and above what we're seeing. You, you might attribute to something like using a psychedelic, um, but I will say a little bit about that. So how might spending more time in this culture of generosity expand the moral circle? Um, our model suggests that the relationship between time that people are spending at these events and the, the reduced discounting um, is partially mediated by transformative experience and universal connectedness for that overlapping circle measures, um, how people feel their self-concept is, is connected with or overlapping with others. And it's these two components of the past that are enhanced when people report recently using psychedelic substances. Um, so one idea is that these substance sources can, in this setting, um, amplify an effect that is nevertheless already there even without substance use. Okay, so I will very soon wrap up. Um, these results suggest that participating in an intentional community with normative generosity can, can engender transformative experiences that manifest as feeling more socially connected to something larger than oneself. And these transformative experiences are associated with hyper generosity and moral expansion. And for some people, at least, it seems like these, this, the effects of this experience are persisting. This is something that we're following up in our current research. We're really interested in what is it about transformative experiences at these events in terms of their content that is more or less strongly predictive of, of sort of holding on to to those effects um, in the months after. Okay, so I just wanna highlight the contrast between the sort of two lines of work that I shared. And you know, Mark Zuckerberg, when he founded Facebook said his goal was to make the world more open and connected. But you know, the irony is not lost on me that these data and a lot of other data from colleagues in my field suggest that you know, mass gatherings that are intentionally designed around sort of communal celebration, generosity, and so on, really old technology for fostering social connection. And the, the psycholo psychological effects we observe there seem to contrast quite starkly with these new technologies, which also are in theory supposed to bring people together, but in practice are maybe driving us apart. So what I am taking away with from this and where our research is going now is I think that this work suggests you know, we're just so sensitive to the stories that we tell about human nature. And while it doesn't make sense to think about human nature as fundamentally selfish or altruistic, the stories we tell about our nature and when we build communities around different versions of the story, we can make our own collective fate. And um, this, uh, this idea is really nicely um, articulated by one of my favorite writers, Rebecca Solnit, who wrote recently about the, the climate crisis Every crisis is in part a storytelling crisis. We're hemmed in by stories that prevent us from seeing or believing in or acting on the possibilities for change. 
what kind of world we can have is all about what stories we tell and whose stories are heard. And I wanna make sure we have time for questions. So I'm just, gonna leave, I'm just gonna end here and I'm really happy to share more about our moral narratives and cultural evolution stuff, but I will leave that for the Q&A. So thank you so much. So I stand. Yes. Hello again. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. I think it's it's really inspiring, and I think this end quote really does a good job at kind of wrapping things up. And my question is pretty related to this because it talks about stories and stories inherently have language to them, Yeah. right? And that is like a big part of how messaging gets across. And so I'm wondering, you talked in our discussion about humanities and what we can learn from pulling that in. And what have you learned from colleagues and maybe like linguistics kind of things that can help us sort of wrap this together and complement your work, particularly in like um, how leaders can use language and messaging to sort of get stories across that might produce more productive outcomes. Oh yeah, 100%. Um, I, uh, I'm i trying to learn more about linguistics and my postdoc, uh, Judy Kim, who's working on, on the narrative stuff has a background in linguistics and her knowledge has been so, useful. Um, so, you know, there, there are a lot of really, really interesting um, theoretical and empirical work on, like, what are the goals of communicators? And, you know, there's a really influential theorist, uh, Grice, who says that, you know, the fundamental goal of a communicator is to be cooperative and informative and to communicate things that are relevant and, and, and leave out stuff that is not relevant. Um, but more recently, there have been um, models that um, that sort of uh, build on this this fundamental theory, and in particular, look at um, sort of how social goals uh, for communication don't always fully align with um, these cooperative uh, informational goals. Um, and so, in our work on moral narratives, we're we're thinking of narrators um, when 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 a narrator constructs a story about something that has happened, particularly if that story has some moral content. Uh, there's an informational goal to just communicate honestly what you think happened. There's also a reputational goal, which is, you know, we, we are such social creatures and we are so strongly motivated to be accepted and liked by other people that we might tell stories to ourselves and others about things that happened to us that are a charitable interpretation of our own behavior and motives or the behavior and motives of, of some, someone who we care about. Um, so, you know, like, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on a specific example, but, um, but I'll just say, so I don't take too long to answer your question, that um, we're thinking a lot about the goals that individuals have when they are explaining their experiences to themselves and other people. And those goals include being honest and, and communicating sort of what they perceive as ground truth, but also a self-protective element or a group protective element. And layered on top of that, if you're seen as being too strategic in your communication, you'll be disbelieved or mistrusted. And so there's also a presentational goal on top of that. And I know that you're a clinical student. And so you asking this question makes me realize this is totally relevant for therapy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a clinician. Um, so I, I have little to say about this, but I would love to talk more about it. So yeah, thank you so much. It's yeah. totally relevant in how yeah. we communicate in therapy. To you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this was a great talk. I loved it. Um, I, it was sort of while you were talking about um, homo economicus, yeah. um, I started thinking about like how selfishness and unselfishness within a single individual can sort of build up to a collective in the way that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And so I do feel like there's sort of a constant sort of push pull between selfishness and unselfishness in a person. Um, and like, and so even at the individual level, when you're thinking about like the expression of moral outrage on Twitter, like I can remember in the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, I was talking to my sister and she was like, well, I feel like I have to post. I feel like I should because I feel like that's the moral thing to do. Um, 
while at the same time, if she had posted, that would have actually, you know, she didn't feel that moral. I mean, she might have felt moral outrage, but not maybe in the moment that she posted. And that would have continued to sort of fuel this problem that you were outlining. And so I'm sort of thinking about how like the individual can, in trying to be good and trying to be moral and trying to maybe even be unselfish, create sort of like an, a selfish collective. And so then that leads into mm. your third part of your talk where you're talking about these sort of large collectives that can that can lead to collective good. But in a way, like the Charlottesville March is also sort of a collective in the same way, just for a collective bad. And so I'm wondering if you have any hypotheses about sort of how the transformative experiences of those types of people that have, that give rise to like really bad outcomes, like what, what that might provoke in those people that might be similar or different to what you found in your Burning Man study? Oh, that's such a good question. I, I often get the question, like, what about Trump rallies? Like, you know, like, would you do your research there? I'm like, oh, I don't really want to go there though. <laughs> but, um, but no, it's, it's a good point. And I, you know, I think I think of I think of mass gatherings as amplifiers. So whatever is already there, whatever sentiments are already there, um, are going to be amplified. And the social media work is nice because it 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 allows you to really quantify that amplification, right? And so, um, I I would like people to think more about just the 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 power of of the collective and 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 how that sort of creates these feed, feedback loops within individuals as well. And what is, I think, really unique and different about social media, and I'm gonna be at a meeting next week um, put on by the Knight Foundation, um, organized by my super smart colleague, Arvind Narayanan, um, who if you are worried about like AI and GPT and you're on Twitter, you should follow my colleague, Arvind. Um, his Twitter feed, or his, his tweet handle is I think Random Walker, but he's in, he's the, the um, He's at the Center for Internet Technology Policy and Computer Science at Princeton. And um, he also has a, a substack called AI Snake Oil and super smart commentary about all of these really rapid developments that are coming out. Anyway, I digress. Um, we're going to this meeting about algorithmic amplification. And you know, one thing that I don't think people realize enough is that every time you post something on social media or click a, the like button, or even just scroll, you are providing data that trains the algorithm. And a lot of that data is not something that you are necessarily even aware of or uh, under conscious control. So, you know, some platforms will collect data on how long you linger on an image or a video. And that is data that is being used to train the algorithm. And so, you know, I, I, I alluded to the idea of culture at the beginning of the talk. And I'm thinking a lot now about how much agency we have in um, creating and sustaining and changing our culture. So in, in the abstract of my talk, and I do have a slide on this, but I, I think it'll be too complicated to get to the slide. Um, the biologist uh, E.O. Wilson sort of famously, famously said that the, the problem the problems of humanity are because we have uh, paleolithic emotions medieval institutions and godlike technologies. And when I first saw that quote, I was like, oh my God, this is genius. And I was like, really you know, interpreted a lot of our early work on outrage is like, oh my gosh, we are stuck. We have these emotional responses that are hardwired and we are just like slaves to the technology. And all we can do is just understand how this all works and then maybe try to design our technologies around it. I actually now think that that view is too pessimistic. And if you read the literature and cultural evolution, what that shows is that it's not just the content of culture that is transmitted from generation to generation. So like what is morally acceptable and what is not. There's also some evidence to suggest, and I find it really tantalizing, that we can also shape our cognition by practices that we do individually and collectively. And so, when we are participating in these massive online social networks and we are providing our behavior and commentary on what uh, is happening in the collective, that is training the algorithm, which then feeds back onto the collective discussion. And so like just being aware of that, I think is, is a first step towards thinking about, well, what data do I want to train this algorithm on? And what do I want to teach Twitter about what kind of content I want to see in my feed in the future? And, um, you know, 
it's tip of the iceberg in terms of what we know. And it's unfortunately um, slow going because these are private companies and um, Twitter used to be the most generous in terms of allowing academics to freely access uh, Twitter data, but they shut it down. So now it costs $42,000 a month to get the amount of Twitter data one would need to do the studies that I showed you today. So that's obviously not sustainable. And you know, you wonder why that might be happening. We are wondering. Thank you. <laughs> Is it working? Okay. Um, really, really interesting talk. Um, I'm really inspired by the research that you're doing. So I kind of have a question that addresses two things like selfishness and pro-social behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I recently did a study with a large marching band looking at um, synchrony and their pro-social behavior. Cool. And the weird thing was that we found they actually like were less pro-social at the end, mm. but maybe because they felt like they had given so much in the beginning. Mm. So I'm kind of wondering, yeah, your thoughts on that, like where the generosity line lands for people. Um, and also, I guess if people think about selfishness differently, like define it differently. Is it um, like if there's selfishness that's for a collective idea, like this makes me feel good and I'm going yeah. to do this. Is that more positive than you know, the alternative. How did you measure pro-social behavior? In, in I don't research? think we did the best job, but we measured it with how likely they were to donate or volunteer to, to various like marching band. Um, okay. Okay. So um, actually I, I, I have some hidden slides that are very relevant oh, to this. Great. So I mentioned earlier my, um, my now graduated PhD student, Ryan Carlson, and um, we were running a lot of studies online during the pandemic. Um, you know, using these very, very standard economic measures of generosity, including dictator games for charity, we were using the Red Cross. Um, and we had the thought or actually, you know, because we started studying narratives a few years ago in my lab, we just started as a standard practice. Um, at the end of all of our studies, having a text box where we ask participants to just like tell us in your own words, like, why you made the decisions you did during the study, how you thought about those decisions. It was super open-ended. Um, and Ryan was running all these studies during the pandemic with the dictator game. And um, the responses that he got were, were really, uh, really eye-opening. And people would say things like, I lost my job in the pandemic. I need to feed my kid. I'm on prolific to make money. Um, I am homeless and living in my car. I can't afford to donate to the Red Cross. Um, why are you asking me to donate to the Red Cross? Like, this is offensive to me. And so Ryan coded those responses as reflecting um, sort of uh, selfish motives or not. And, um, you know, other people also were like, I make a lot of money. I don't really need it. Red Cross seems like a reasonable um, place to donate to. And what was really striking about Ryan's findings is that he he categorized or he 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 binned those free responses according to whether an economic model would categorize a subject as selfish or generous. And so people who keep all the money money for themselves um, are like selfish according to these very, very widespread, long-standing methodological standards in our field, um, but like a really upsetting percentage of those subjects were reporting income levels that were well below the poverty line in the US and reporting reasons for keeping the money like I need to feed my kid. And so is it fair and is it scientifically valid to categorize those people as selfish? And what kind of inferences might we be making scientifically from putting selfish motives on participants um, without asking them how they felt about the actual decision situation. And um, I, I think this is a real problem for our field. We're, we're, we're working on a paper about this right now. And I think it actually goes back to the norm of self-interest, right? Like when you have uh, a default assumption of like people are selfish, then you naturally interpret keeping everything for yourself in a dictator game as being selfishly motivated. But you haven't actually measured motives, though, and so maybe you shouldn't make that conclusion. And you know, I'm being very critical. I have done this so many times in my own papers. Like I fully admit to participating in this practice, and we're we're just sort of doing doing the work of of uh, thinking about how we we could change things. So that was a very long um, answer to your question. But I would encourage you um, to 
get more subject res subjective responses in your participants and a result that looks like they're not being generous might not actually reflect that. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, I really love the presentation. I was writing down lots of questions the whole time, um, but I think I'll stay on script. <laughs> um, I wanted to speak towards your research on transformative experiences at the um, mass gatherings. Um, as a side note, um, getting Templeton to pay me to do research at Burning Man, hi, on my personal list of goals. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to put that out there. Um, so, you know, a lot of your research or this recent research examines the role of culture in facilitating transformative experiences. And my question for you is without religious communities predominant, predominating secular society, um, do secular cultures um, lack a common mechanism for transformative experiences? And if you had to speculate, through what other means are people looking for transformative experiences? Oh, that's a great question. And I mean, I think, you know, there are just so many different ways to, to access those mental states. And, and for the, the audience who hasn't necessarily read our work on this, we're, we're, we're defining transformative experience um, in a particular way, which is inspired by the work of the philosopher Lori Paul. And Lori defines a transformative experience um, as having two important components. The first is epistemic transformation, meaning that um, the experience uh, provides you with new knowledge and specifically a knowledge of what something is like that you couldn't have had without having had the experience. So she gives a, she gives a classic philosophical example of this thought experiment called Mary in the Black and White Room. And uh, the thought experiment is about an individual called Mary who grows up in a room that only has black and white um, colors in it. Um, but she reads a lot of textbooks about color. And so she is an expert in like, how the brain and the eye like perceives color. She knows everything there is to know about color's perception, but she has never seen color herself. And so when she steps out of the black and white room and experiences what it is like to see color for the first time, that is an epistemic transformation. Mm -hmm. And a personal transformation, I think follows from some, but not all epistemic transformations. So Laurie argues that um, some sorts of epistemic transformations are so powerful and meaningful that they can have a lasting impact on a person's values, what they prioritize in life. Um, so the classic example that she gives is becoming a parent for, for, for the first time. We're actually um, about to start a study um, where we're uh, longitudinally following people who are becoming parents for the first time and looking at cool. transformative experiences and how their self-concept changes or doesn't change. Um, so that, that's fun. So uh, in our studies, we are, we are uh, you know, it, we're still working on developing really precise measures of these two components of transformative experiences. But I think uh, speaking to your question, you know, there are lots of different ways to have epistemic transformation. I think that like one reason why Lori's work has had such an impact is because like, I think most people will have transformative experiences in their lives and they won't have to be uh, religious to do so. Sure. Um, but I do think that there there is a particular kind of transformative experience that might that might be might be common in religious settings, which relates back to the, the idea of awe and, and the, the, the feeling of smallness and, and expansiveness. Mm -hmm. um, that I wrote, those two things are contradicting, but for some reason they don't feel contradictory to me. Sure. Um, you know, that also arises, you know, in, in natural settings, meditation practice, psychedelic substances, um, interacting with loved ones in a particular way. Um, so I think Dacher Keltner's book, I think has a really good, I haven't read it yet, but it's on my list um, for, you know, ways to access these, these types of um, sort of what we might call pro-social transformative experiences. Um, but I mean, going back to the, the question about religion, you know, one does wonder like, what is the long-term impact in a culture of, of and I'm, I'm gonna replace the word religion with spirituality, sure. because yeah. I think institution, of religion is a different thing from a spiritual practice. And um, yeah, I do wonder what the long-term effect, term effects are on a culture of, of uh, prioritizing or deprioritizing spirituality. Yeah, I'm thinking about it in terms of um, a community orientation as well. If part of the motivation for seeking these online communities is that as a society, we're sort of like lacking the structure. <laughs> 
to like find a common community, like where we share ideologies. I don't know if you think that's related in any way. Well, I mean, I think I think that you know, going going back to our outrage work, um, I don't have data to address this directly, but my intuition, based on what I know about the neural basis of outrage, is that there there and the social psychology of outrage is that like there is something very rewarding about mm -hmm. expressing outrage collectively, and the fact that we see people doing it, even when it's very very unlikely that the target of the outrage is even going to see it. But there is some sort of bonding element there. Mm -hmm. And I, your question makes me wonder now if, if like that is a substitute. I actually, I had the thought early in the pandemic and there's a lot of outrage online. And, you know, I should have said this early in the talk. My work is often misinterpreted as saying outrage is bad. I for sure don't want to say that. Mm -hmm. Outrage is absolutely essential for social progress. And particularly um, when there is injustice that is being perpetrated against a minoritized group yeah. by a more powerful group. So definitely not saying that outrage is bad. Um, I do wonder, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were, we were, we were catapulted into this state of deep moral uncertainty. It was like all of our typical norms of like how to be a good person were all of a sudden called into question where it's like, oh, if I go to the grocery store, am I maybe going to infect, some, infect somebody and not know it? And that would be horrible, but also I really need to go to the grocery store. And so what do I do? And we weren't getting good messages from mm -hmm. institutions. Like we're getting a lot of mixed messages from institutions. And part of me wondered whether some of the really like inflated outrage that I, I perceived to be online that when it was not about the pandemic, it was about small stuff. Like people got yeah. really annoyed about other people, like people going to the beach. There was this whole thing about like, taking pictures of other people going to the beach during the pandemic. And this was like horrible and bad. And like, we now know that actually that, that was fine. And probably on, on the collective level, like in terms of balancing like likelihood of infection versus individual well-being, like going outside was a good thing to do during yeah. the pandemic. But there was all this outrage about it. And part of me wondered whether people just really wanted to collectively participate in an exercise that assured them that they were on the good side of whatever was going on. Like that that yeah. was like an assurance that people needed. I, I, like I, I, I like wondered about that. Spirituality gives you that usually. It gives you a sense of For better or for worse. Yeah. A lot of times for worse, but yeah. yeah. Very interesting, thank you. Okay, so uh, let's open it up. I'm gonna ask uh, an initial question or two. Um, uh, one little one, uh, uh, the story that you told about uh, the, uh, folks who were homeless and uh, who needed to feed their children uh, really certainly calls into question, in my view, the, the use of financial currency yep. uh, as a metric of, yep. uh, of generosity. Yep. And so, um, uh, so Ryan what about page. all the other yeah. possibilities? And, yeah. and particularly, I mean, one of the things that I would be so interested in is there are um, ways of being generous that require no financial resources. Mm -hmm. uh, simply saying thank you is a way of being generous yep. uh, and other kinds of social behavior of that sort. And I wonder if you're collecting any of those kind of data. And, you know, I think in many ways, those kind of data would be more persuasive. Totally. I totally agree. And, and the, the working title of, of the paper that Ryan and I are working on is called Pay to Play Morality. Um, the idea being that like there's this, this proliferation of using money as a proxy for you know, morality and pro-social pro motives and behavior. And like, as you correctly say, it's so much broader than that. I think the reason that it's become so popular is because it's convenient. Exactly. I'm it's convenient. And like, because, you know, and I have a lot to say about academic culture in general, but there's so much pressure to publish and be productive that like, it makes sense that researchers, you know, collectively are going to gravitate towards, oh, I'm interested in generosity. Okay, cool. We'll do a dictator game on MTurk or prolific because it's affordable. And it's like, you know, it's the standard in the field. But like, I, I think that that deserves rethinking. So um, yeah. And, you know, if you look at the history of social psychology, it, like this didn't used to be a thing. Like 
social psychologists in the sort of like golden age of social psychology. And of course there are problems, you know, tiny sample sizes and, and so on. But, um, but this, the, the theater of like classic social psychology was like, I, I, I would love to see that come back in, in that, you know, there, a lot of effort was invested in creating realistic social situations that made people uh, in participants in these experiments, you know, feel like they had opportunities to like, help somebody pick up the, the pencils that they have spilled while walking down the hall. Like there's a lot of really, really clever methods that because you can't do them online and they they take a lot of time and effort there, no one is really doing them. Um, but I, I don't know if that's a good thing. No. So one other just brief question. Um, the, uh, the mass gathering work and the possibility of harnessing mass gatherings to Remote pro-social behavior. I mean, I think you you've made a very convincing case that it it can occur. Uh, uh, however, the the magnitude of the problem uh, is so massive, and the percentage of the population that may participate in such gatherings oh, yeah. is going to be such a sliver. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and then on the other hand, we heard from you all of this um, negative stuff that I think is um, uh, extremely important and well put about technology and its uh, nefarious effects. Uh, can you envision the possibility of, well, let me say it a different way, how can we use technology to actually um, promote pro-social behavior? Do you see a role for it? And uh, if so, how? I mean, I think in theory, yes. Um, in the context of the present sort of capitalistic profit-driven system and who is in charge, I'm not super optimistic, but I do, I do have, um, you know, from a scientific perspective, I, I, I think that the answer is in, is in narrative. And, um, and the, the work that, that I'm uh, developing right now, um, I'm so tempted to just go to the next slide because it's right there. Is that okay? Okay, so um, moral narratives are stories. They're told by a narrative about a target to an audience. Um, they contain information that triggers moral judgments about the target. Um, so things like gossip, news that could be real or fake, propaganda, also the things we think about when we're lying awake at 3 a.m. and worrying about some interaction we had with somebody. These are all examples of, of what we're calling moral narrative exchanges. And I mentioned earlier in response to your question that um, narrators have these different goals that they seek to satisfy when they construct narratives. Um, and a successful exchange is when the narrator puts their worldview of what happened onto the audience. Um, and the key insight that we have come to is that moral narrative exchange transmits not just the surface level content, like what the story is about, but also a deeper structure. So for example, theories of a seemingly pro-social behavior as being selfishly motivated. And so you can see uh, in this example, this is a really classic kind of meme that comes up in our Twitter studies all the time. So you see uh, Charlie Kirk owns virtue signaling liberal student on climate change, the crowd erupts. This is like a super well-engineered piece of viral media. And so, okay, the surface content is like this particular student in this in instance is being dishonest, but below the surface, the message that's being communicated is this you know, norm of self-interest that like when people engage in activism, they're doing that because they are selfish. They're just trying to make themselves look good. And so what these individual stories do, they're not just shaping beliefs about the situation in question. They're also providing data that's updating everyone who sees the stories priors about how to interpret future moral situations and how to narrate those to themselves and others. So you mentioned Black Lives Matter on social media. So someone who has seen this story and inherited or absorbed this data point that activism is actually selfish, they might be more inclined when they see another piece of activism that, um, oh, this person's also virtue signaling. And so individual narratives, especially when they're like bombarded and amplified through social media, um, can train people's sort of deeper intuitive theories about how to interpret moral situations. And over time, this, this, this can 
I think proliferate just a widespread belief that, oh, when people are doing activism, it's because they're virtue signaling or they're selfish, which is a more specific manifestation of the norm of self-interest or homo economicus, right? But it doesn't have to be like that. It is like that. And I think the reason it is like that is because the norm of self-interest is super convenient for people who want to exploit others. So if you are in power, if you control channels of communication, um, you might be more likely uh, either explicitly or probably a lot of this is implicit to just favor templates that are excusing rather than responsibilizing in terms of actions that affect other people. And so what we're thinking about now is like, are there structures that are, um, that are resistant to these sort of dominant or, um, you know, uh, culturally pervasive um, narrative structures that just sort of provide a lens through which to see the world in, in a way that's maybe more closed off and, and selfish um, and, you know, sort of understanding the dynamics of like how the, the deeper structures and the surface level content uh, interact and also um, depend on the power dynamics between who the narrator is and the audiences um, are sort of paths I see to using technology for good, as you say. A number of virtual questions, and there's two that are related that I'll just run by you. Uh, one is um, from uh, Ali Frosto. How is financial access and class considered in the research about the intentional communities, events, or events, and the cost of attending or opting to be part of them? And then the, a related one um, in your work on the consequences of overperceived outrage how does race, gender, identity, or sexual orientation of outrage authors and observers? as well as the theme of outrage messages impact the observer's ratings of relative outrage? Oh, these are great questions. So with regard to the first question, we did collect information about uh, individuals' income level. Um, I don't recall it off the top of my head, but it is in the paper. Um, more broadly, I think the question is about like who is, like, who is able to access events like this? And the organization does think a lot about this um, and they do have a low income ticket program. Um, so that's better than nothing. I'm sure it could be better. And I think this goes back to Richie's point that I, I think that the, the main takeaway from our research on, on Burning Man and other um, experimental uh, communities is not that like, this is the solution for everyone to like be nicer to each other. Cause obviously that's not scalable. But what I do think is that it's a really nice demonstration of the insight that like a culture that has norms can from day one really dramatically change people's levels of generosity from what we would expect from the literature on generosity, all of which was conducted in this culture, which is a different culture than the one that we see at those festivals. Um, so I, I think it's more of like a proof of concept than like a scalable intervention by any means. The second question about um, race and gender of authors and observers, um, great question. Um, we haven't gone that fine grained in our research yet. We did balance our samples in terms of liberal and conservative, um, but um, we can't actually infer the race or gender of the tweet message authors. Um, we, we could have asked them, but we chose not to um, because we didn't have specific hypothesi hypotheses about that. Um, it's a super interesting question. Would love to do that study. Too bad Elon shut it down. Um, sorry, I'm like really upset about this in case you can't tell. Like, you know, we just started this program. Like everyone, yeah, everyone in this community is really, really frustrated with this. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I think we've got, a, we got another microphone too. That was a really awesome talk, by the way. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about when y'all were talking about uh, money as a marker for generosity, is there a precedent in the literature of, of using a mutual aid framework as a way of trying to ask people about generosity? Like, because, you know, within like mutual aid and all that, there's people helping each other, but a lot of times mutual aid happens when people don't have money. Yeah. So the type of generosity being expressed is the stuff they can do. Yeah. So I, I love that question. idea. And as far as I'm aware, no one in this corner of, of uh, behavioral science is, is thinking about that, but that's a great suggestion. So I appreciate it.
Can you hear me? So much of what you're talking about makes me think about community and connection um, as Hadley brought up and parallels in some ways the the day-to-day the -day existence for a lot of us in terms of whether people are working remotely or attending Zoom remotely or remote school and the impacts there. And I was wondering whether what your thoughts are there in terms of if we want to our culture to evolve and be more generous and pro-social, whether we really should try to steer away from remote work, uh, joining over Zoom, but actually connect together and be together. Yeah, that's that's a great person, a great question, and I I totally share your intuition. I I hesitate to draw inferences from my lab's research to that specific question because it feels like uh, a gap. But I I will I will say what one of my favorite papers that came out in the last um, couple of years, um, which I will direct you all to, um, and I use this as an argument for uh, encouraging my students to have meetings in person. Um, there was a group of researchers who I think very systematically um, studied creativity in group meetings and they compared creativity and generativity uh, in uh, Zoom meetings versus in-person meetings. And unsurprisingly, they found that um, creativity and generativity um, were much higher in person than on Zoom. This came out in Nature um, a year, like within the past two years. Um, and I think if you just do a search for Nature, creativity, Zooms, um, you'll find it. But I, I, I found that to be really compelling. And I, I send it to a lot of people to make this argument. Um, the pro-social side, I think the most relevant work comes from Juliana Schroeder at Berkeley. And um, she has shown through some really um, beautifully designed experiments, uh, differences in empathy and, um, and uh, mutual understanding uh, when you move from an in-person interaction to a voice only interaction to a text only interaction. And what she shows is that there, there's a lot of important information um, that, that doesn't make it across these uh, different forms of media um, that's essential for sort of uh, empathic understanding. So that that also feels to me like pretty compelling evidence for the in-person side. Hello, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I am just wondering how your, I guess, consumption of social media has changed or if it hasn't changed with your um, findings. I took Twitter off my phone um, and I, I installed an app that like, blocked it off my phone. And I think there's a bug on the app because I deinstalled the, the blocker app, but I still can't even get Twitter on the like Safari browser on my phone, which is mostly great. Sometimes somebody will send me a text message that has a Twitter link. And because I don't have the app on my phone and because Safari indefinitely blocks Twitter because of the <laughs> software that isn't even on the phone still, like can't get Twitter on my phone. So that is that was super helpful. Um, yeah, I just, I, I, I do still like participate as an observer, but, um, I, I realized that for my own personal well-being that the feedback loop of like posting and waiting for feedback and seeing what people think was like extremely destructive for me personally. So I don't really do that. Um, Thank you. I, I had a question regarding um, pro-social communities um, online. So for example, open source communities or on Twitter, for example, the R group is extremely active and very, very supportive. And so I was wondering, um, was there a plan of, um, you know, study or probably now? now on <laughs> That's a great idea. No, I, I uh, as soon as you said that, I'm like, oh, you're totally right. This would be a really, really interesting kind of, um, like intermediary condition, like you go from the like outrage on Twitter to like Burning Man in person, like what's what's the in-between? I love that, that's such a cool idea. Um, I might follow up with you. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, I think I'm next. <laughs> I was just wondering if you have looked at or if anyone has looked at that you work with um, schools and bullying behavior and, the relationship with social media um, mm. there? So I have not. Um, some of the, the most 
uh, important research that I know of on bullying in schools is from my colleague Betsy Levy Palak. Um, and I, I don't I don't think that she has looked at the role of social media in that, although your question makes me think I should ask her about this. It's a really interesting idea. But she looked at the effects of an anti-bullying intervention in schools, and specifically she measured the social network structure of the, the students in the schools. And, and what they found, if I'm remembering this correctly, it's been a while since I read it, is um, when you direct the intervention towards uh, students in the network who are central, you get a much bigger impact of the intervention than when you uh, intervene on everyone or, uh, or like more peripheral people. So um, that that work I think really powerful demonstrates that like being aware of the the structure and description of the social connect work, uh, connections within a network um, can help you tar target your interventions. And that also suggests like going back to the idea about narratives, like. Maybe there are ways in which seeding social networks, um, people who are central with particular narrative structures that we expect to uh, resist the homo economicus model uh, might be an interesting strategy. All right. Um, yeah, I think I next. Thank you so much for the talk. It's making me think a lot about my own relationship with Twitter and the way I share things. Um, I, I wanted to go back to the the discussion about norms and norms being having descriptive and prescriptive elements. Yeah. I, I've been thinking a lot lately about like the, the naturalistic fallacy and whether it's actually useful mm -hmm. or, or not mm -hmm. to make these arguments that I see a lot uh, around like gender a lot lately about like, well, this is what we see in nature. So this is what the, this is what is appropriate and this is what is acceptable. And so it's, it's, it's fallacious, but it can sometimes be useful. Like also like Franz de Waal's books, which have combated the homo economist right. model, like yeah. Mama's Last Hug and the Age of Empathy, arguing that non-human primates are naturally empathic. So like humans should be empathic is sort of the implication. And I'm wondering whether you think that's a, a positive trend or, it, cause it also makes me un uncomfortable because you can also see how it could go the other direction. Yeah, I love that question. And I the way you asked it made me think about um, one of the arguments I made in my talk and maybe phrasing it in a, in a slightly different way, which is like an assumption behind like naturalistic arguments is essentialism, right? That there's some like deep biological unchanging essence. And I, I just like, maybe I'm reading the wrong stuff, but like my read of the literature on human like pro-sociality and selfishness is that there's no there there. Like there isn't anything essential. And the, oh, I have, I am now close to the, the slide of um, this guy. And this is a nice note to wrap up because I think we're getting to the time, right? So like this idea that we are stuck with our essential nature is like pretty pessimistic when you think about it. It's like, oh, like, we are the way we are and too bad. And I guess the best we can do is like be a little smart about it and design institutions that will keep our inherently selfish nature in check or whatever. But there's an alternative perspective. Um, this is Celia Hayes. She wrote a book called Cognitive Gadgets in 2018 that I think is wonderful. It's really changed the way I think about um, culture and evolution. Um, and she argues that culture is responsible not just for the grist of the mind, what we do and make, but also for fabricating its mills, the very way the mind works. And the implication of this is that people alive today, parents, peers, educators, elders, politicians, lawyers, have a lot of responsibility. Like we get to choose who we are. We get to choose by the actions that we take, uh, what we collectively you know, normalize, whether that be in a descriptive sense or a prescriptive sense, which you know, are really difficult to separate in practice. And so I, I, I think your argument is correct in that, or your intuition is correct, that arguments that lean on naturalism or essentialism are training the priors to interpret new situations in terms of essentialism, which is maybe not a helpful way to think about ourselves. Um, and so how, you know, I, I think that I'm, I'm going to think more about this because I haven't considered it until now, but it's a really, really great question that I will think more about. 
Do we have time for another? Okay, okay. <laughs> thanks. Um, the earlier question about schools and bullying jacked my memory about thinking about mentalization-based therapy, where you teach people how to think about the minds and mental states of others and mm -hmm. decrease school bullying. And what this had me thinking about was your slide where people infer motives of others, like the moral narratives. Yeah. And it's really, really cool and really descriptive of how we infer. We have these past priors. And I wonder if you thought at all about if we could employ something like mentalization to teach people to infer differently. So mm. less of a passive reliance on what you're inferring, but more of an active process. And if that might actually change that pattern of how we infer others' motives. Yes, I think that that is correct. And um, one, one connection that I'm hoping to draw out um, by talking to more clinicians is how the process of, of changing your own narrative in therapy and learning to make different inferences about other people and about yourself um, to sort of um, make meaning out of situations you experience, like how does that scale up or can it scale up to the collective level? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to think about that. Well, there's a very recent picture. See if you can recognize any of the folks in that picture. So um, it's it's time to close the meeting. And uh, this is a tradition that Richie have, and I have been doing for 27 years, I think we decided, uh, or at least as far back as we can remember. And uh, each meeting feels better than the last. And this one was just absolutely outstanding. Um, the speakers were great. Uh, the diversity of the topics, I think, uh, and as well as their interrelatedness was really unusual and really cool. I think from my perspective, going all the way from molecular phenomena to sleep to treatment issues and refractory depression to more societal issues related to how we can improve, hopefully, humanity and, and think about pro-social behavior and, and improving that and augmenting that. So it's just been really spectacular from my perspective. And as always, Richie, it's always always fun to be doing this together. And uh, I look forward to, to many, many more. I wanna thank the participants for coming and hanging out with us and also congratulate the uh, folks that won the travel awards and also to thank uh, the folks that supported us as well. And there you can see next year when we're gonna be doing it, we've got the dates already. So it's not too early to mark your calendars. Richie, why don't you say it? Yeah, so uh, I just want to express my gratitude and uh, especially to all the trainees who uh, worked on this material this semester. Uh, it was great to have you. And if any of you have suggestions for speakers next year, send them our way. And uh, thank you all for participating.